Bonjour, mesdames et uh, messieurs. Uh, so good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, uh, I'm greatly honored and privileged uh, to be here. French National Academy of Science of uh, over 350 years of history. It's a very nice-looking uh, environment here. Also, I'm very pleased to give my, uh, my talk to you uh, today uh, on uh, visual understanding of 3D objects and scenes for robotic tasks. Uh, since I have only 30 minutes, but I prepared for about 40 minutes presentation, so I will speed up my talk. I apologize for that. My talk is uh, mostly some sort of a history of uh, what I have been doing in my lab in terms of uh, uh, implementing uh, visually guided uh, robotic service. So, in the first, I will talk about conventional method to achieve this uh, visually guided robotic service, then move to how we can overcome the limitation of conventional method using uh, emerging deep learning uh, capabilities, and then finally, how we can also um, deal with the challenges associated with the current deep learning. Uh, so first, I would uh, like to give you what I mean by robotic service. Uh, this video shows uh, the robotic service that uh, I have been working on. Here, the robot is asked to find a cup go to the juice dispenser, and then take the juice that the user asked the robot to bring, and then go to the user, and then uh, find the user, and then uh, visually uh, guide the handover to the user. This is the, uh, the task that uh, uh, shown in this video. Um, here, there is no structured component. Everything is unstructured. This robot is using only vision to carry out this task. Uh, this robot is not only visually guided air and service capability, but also it has uh, social interaction capabilities, such as uh, yeah, it has user-friendly multimedia avatar, and also user localization with uh, integrated Wi-Fi, gesture, and the face. And then, uh, as I mentioned, uh, automatic object handover with the 3D vision. But I'm not going to talk about social interaction aspect of the robot, but I'm going to talk about visually guided errand service by this service robot. Okay. Then... Uh, what is the challenge in uh, vision-guided or vision-based robotic service in this cluttered environment? I think, as you all know, handling uncertainties to variations in visual environment is very important, such as uh, distance, orientation, illumination, occlusion, color distortion, merging, you name. Yeah. Okay, oops. Uh, how to handle these uh, uncertainties in the uh, in visual environment? The approach I took for this one is somewhat different from maybe others. I thought how human vision is uh, so reliable and dependable. So my answer to that question was uh, human vision is dependable as it can self-define its mission from stimulus, stimuli and has the will to accomplish, accomplish its mission by mobilizing its resources into collective cognitive processes 
and behaviors. This is uh, what I thought that uh, how human, like a biological system, can achieve dependability. Not uh, developing perfect sensors or perfect algorithms. So, in a very primitive way, I started to implement uh, this thing uh, with three uh, major component. One is uh, in situ optimal feature selection. There are many objects uh, in the environment. Then at a certain situation, at a certain moment, this robot understands the environment or perceives environmental situations, conditions, and then pick up the, select the best feature set for individual object. The second one is uh, if you pick up these evidences uh, on the fly, then your recognition system must be adaptive. So that is adaptive Bayesian network, so that this Bayesian network is adaptively generated. I will talk a little bit more about this one later. And then uh, based on uh, this adaptive way of generating Bayesian network, you make a decision. But the decision is not sufficient. You come back to collect more evidences. So these three components are the rudimentary implementation of the way how human could achieve dependability. So as I mentioned before, uh, we have in situ optimal feature selection. Then uh, this evidence is uh, structured in end or tree structure, but it's changing in time. But then uh, this Bayesian network, Bayesian network with this conditional table is always updated statistically based on this changing uh, evidence structure. And then if uh, as I said, evidence is not enough. It goes to next best pose to collect more evidences. So this, this is what uh, is shown uh, in this video. So one example is that uh, while robot is moving around the scene, it just collects and accumulates these evidences. So as you see in this one, this Blue represent occluded area, red represented covered area. So this accumulation is continuous uh, happening for more evidences. Now this is the demo. So we use the 3D descriptors as uh, uh, features. Also 3D descriptors plus 2D photometric features together. But there is pool of these features, and then uh, this robot, while monitoring the environment, pick up which set of features. It's not a single set, it's uh, many sets. Which sets of features provide uh, sufficient uh, condition for decision making? So in the left side, you see that there are about 11 target object recognition. These objects are recognized simultaneously in 150 to 200 milliseconds. Uh, it's very fast and also very accurate. I would say that the recognition rate here is talking about almost 100% because you collect more evidences anyway. The right, right side is a little bit slower because uh, we use 3D shape descriptors and also 2D photometric features like uh, many point uh, invari I mean the invariant uh, point features uh, shift like, like, like that kind of thing. Oops. So, so here is some dependability I, I can show. Oops, here. So for instance, uh, uh, right, uh, upper right, even though we just, uh, while robot is uh, working, uh, if we turn up 
right is okay. No, there is no problem. The left one, that is, uh, you just uh, change the environment. Why nobody is uh, yeah, visually recognizing and then uh, grasping or whatever, but it's okay. And then even you just, uh, why nobody is trying to capture it? Uh, you pick up the target object and you just hide it. Well, that's no problem. So this is a kind of uh, examples that I can show you. So this is, uh, I mean, the, another example, but I will skip it for the sake of time. Well, uh, up to now, it is uh, good. I, I, I could achieve very high recognition rate, very high success rate uh, in this collected environment. But, but what is the problem? Well, it, this system has no scale, scalability. We can handle object of, let's say, 30, no problem. But what if we have to handle thousands of them or hundreds of them? Well, it doesn't scale. So that's one problem. Also, as I mentioned, I'm using a 3D shape descriptor or any uh, 2D photometric features, but difficulty is in feature engineering. You have to carve all these things manually uh, with some statistical experimentation, all these things, to make it work right. But the more important thing is, as you know, that the performance saturation, when it, it is scaled up, performance starts to drop. This is a well-known fact. So you see in many uh, uh, references it tells you that's, that's the case. So, well, now, deep learning is capable of handle big data. I mean, the, also, it is able to construct, I mean, the, able to extract the features. So why not, using this capability of feature extraction, I will talk about feature reconstruction later, but feature extraction and uh, capable of handling big data to solve that problem that the conventional method has. This is what I was doing. You know that in 2D, deep learning has been advanced so much. So more than 1,000 categories, I mean, hundreds of millions of images, uh, objects can be well classified, more than 97%. And then, you know that image to text, image to image translation, semantic image synthesis are all possible these days. But unlike 2D, 3D is a little bit less. Still, we have only 40 categories, model at 40. But model at 40 the, is based on CAD model, not the real partial 3D data from 3D camera. So this is, but still uh, 40 categories, uh, recognition rate is as good as uh, 2D. So why for 3D? Actually, representation matters because uh, 3D, of, of course, demand more computing power, demand more memory, whatever. So it, is, uh, it requires the, what uh, maybe the, comp the, the network structure will be more complex, whatever, and then uh, it's uh, not easy to handle. So of course, I mean, there are schools of people dealing with 3D. One is, why don't we use uh, a set of 2D to represent 3D, or, or we can use Voxel, we can use Octree, we can use Point Cloud directly, whatever, yeah? But still, as I said, 3D is uh, not as good as 2D. So here is a proposed approach that I will show you uh, that uh, we have done uh, this one. We use RGBD 3D Point Cloud. As you know, I mean, the, most of you may know about this 2D fast RCNN. It, it, it does a region proposal uh, based on uh, image net based VGG, whatever. But we also use 3D octree segmentation together. So 
we generate 3D region proposal. Then, instead of, I mean, VGG is used in uh, fast r CNN, but in our case, we use specially designed 3D classifier, recognition and reconstruction network, we call FER CNN. So this is, uh, yeah, okay. We call FER CNN here. Also, I will talk about CSNL, clustering segmentation network. So this is the, uh, yeah, in the last part. Then, not only doing this one, but here the main thing is uh, this network is capable of doing deep feature reconstruction. I know that uh, these days the interpretability is important, so people use the attention mechanism like uh, layer-wise uh, relevance propagation or heat map generation, whatever. But this is also similar to that, but this has a deep feature reconstruction. As I will tell, tell you about this one shortly. Then this reconstruction features are connected to ontology. So ontology is connected to this uh, reconstruction deep features, and then semantic uh, labeling and understanding can be done through ontology. So this is uh, part of it. And then these results goes to Bayesian reasoning to come up with the final uh, decision making. So let's go to one by one, uh, 3D region proposal. Yeah, so the, here we have a region proposal, 2D region proposal by Vasta RCNN, but there are also other ways to, to doing this one that might maybe mask to uh, RCN and whatever. And then uh, we have this uh, 3D oak tree segmentation. And then uh, this uh, 3D, 2D are interprojected to come up with the final uh, 3D vision proposal. As, so, this is what uh, we are doing. And then the, the, this feature extraction and reconstruction network, which does deep feature extraction and the deep feature reconstruction is uh, uh, like this. So here, this is uh, maybe, oops, this is ordinary CNN. But the interesting part is here. This is a feedback mechanism layer by layer to the input in such a way that these weights are trained to represent feature reconstruction. So this is a feed forward and feedback. Feedback is trained for feature reconstruction. So this, as, as I said, uh, here we have ontology feature, and then also we can manually carve the shape descriptors that can be input for decision making through uh, ensemble kind of thing. But then that's, uh, yeah. So here is training of uh, uh, reconstruction. So we have uh, uh, two loss here, but the important thing is uh, Layer-wise, we have uh, X and H, then it is uh, reconstructed, but then we go to this input, then H dash. So this error is uh, minimized, so that uh, wherever you pick up a neuron, I mean, I mean the hidden unit, whatever, then uh, you can go through the uh, backward uh, feedback uh, weight to come up with the, uh, the reconstructed image. But it's not only from one neuron. You can define receptive field. You can define whatever, so that uh, you can generate reconstructed image as you wish. So this is one of the uh, network architecture we are uh, developing, we developed. So here we have iteration of this one. Then let's say this. Uh, a uh, chair from model F40 can be uh, reconstructed after nicely like that with the probabilities associated with it. 
Yeah, here is some uh, experimental result here. Uh, in terms of recognition, it, some examples where 2D bridges recognition fails, but if we use a 3D proposal with FER CNN uh, recognition, then it just have a very high recognition rate. So these are the uh, failed example for BGG, but then, uh, I mean, this is not, but then this, some, some, some sort of, then this can compensate this uh, weakness of uh, 2D only. So this is another example here. But of course, I mean, the, our FPRCN is not uh, perfect. In a sense, if you have very, uh, in a sense, uh, this kind of uh, uh, partial data, then uh, it come up with the uh, wrong uh, recognition. So, yeah, this is uh, yeah, some sort of a comparison with what has been done, but uh, I was uh, in, in, in a mostly similar to the other people, about 90% more than 40, but more than 10, 97% so far. But what is important is not this one, but the next thing, that is, uh, we have this deep feature reconstruction, and then as I said, this deep feature reconstruction is connected to object ontology. So that we can uh, sem semantically label these uh, features, reconstructed features, and then that can be linked to ontology so that we can go to the semantic uh, understanding of this object. Yeah, for instance, uh, yeah, layer-wise feature reconstruction or attention mechanism, uh, we built is, as I said, it's feedback, but it's trained, so, so that it's not just uh, like uh, normalized for the weight to bring it back. We have different uh, feedback structure that is trained to do this job. So, for instance, this part is uh, recon I mean, the extracted, this part is extracted, but depends on which one. You can have a response field uh, uh, separately so that you can have different uh, way of reconstructing the, uh, this thing. Then, as I said before, here is ontology, then uh, these uh, reconstructed features are given as a region proposal and then go to ontology and then uh, it's linked to symbolic uh, knowledge. So here is an example. So these are uh, the constructed parts, and then uh, this is, uh, we implemented ontology, and then uh, this is a tall pillar, but like this labeling is done through this ontology. And then some of these, uh, properties associated with ontology can be also extracted from ontology. So, so that, uh, let's say that uh, we have a bottleneck at tall pillar, but this object is not correctly recognized because the probability is low. But if you go to ontology and then these two important features of this object is uh, identified, then you come up with, uh, aha, this is a bottle. Confidently, you can say in that way. In that sense, I said, not only this uh, direct classification rate, but also through ontology, we can improve our uh, recognition dependability. Also, as I mentioned, I mean, you can reconstruct a cluster mean, then it comes up like this. <coughs> then uh, if you go to, yeah, if, if, you, if you reconstruct this one, then uh, you can, yeah, I mean, this one is, uh, yeah, these four are reconstructed so that uh, if we go to ontology, then we have all these four objects are coming out so that uh, you, you can have uh, what objects are related to this particular uh, blood or, I mean, the mean average kind of uh, object. So that's also what we, we, we can, we know. Now, I'm not satisfied with what I did so far. This is more or less uh, uh, improving current deep learning. But 
I just wanted to meet the challenges of deep learning. You know what the challenges of deep learning already. So one thing is uh, generalization. Yeah, I mean that uh, you see that uh, there is, yeah, if, if you have some small difference, it's car, it's not car. This example is plenty. Small random pattern added, come up with the wrong yeah, decision. This is, I mean, the uh, generalization problem. You all know already, yeah? So, but this problem, so-called trade-off between generalization and the accuracy or overfitting, has been around in pattern recognition for maybe 60 years, I think, yeah? But has not been solved yet. But this is a very difficult issue. Uh, but another one is data dependency. Yeah, I mean that um, if you have a really deep layer of architecture, you know that you need a lot more data. Otherwise, uh, it simply doesn't work. Also, if you don't have a amount of data required for this complexity of a network, you are you will have a high, higher error rate. This is well known already. Also data bias. Yeah, I mean, you use sometimes uh, many data here, small data there. Then what happened? I mean, that, uh, this one example is uh, this system recognizes uh, uh, white people very well. But then it comes to black people and uh, because of uh, Small number of data, it comes up with the wrong answer. This is why, but there are plenty of these examples. Then uh, interpretability. This is, uh, yeah, yeah, how you can explain what's happening. Uh, so this is important. Some people say, oh, no, no, end to end is enough. But I think, I don't think that's the case, in my opinion. This is important. But then, how we can do that, so, but this is uh, also very active ongoing area. So as I said, this uh, attention mechanism with uh, layer-wise uh, propagation or heat map, and then connecting this one to some uh, uh, semantic labeling or whatever, this is, uh, I, I think, ongoing work. The other one is uh, we cannot do incremental learning or one-shot learning. Human can do it very well. We need small number of samples. We can learn it from this small number of samples, but not deep learning network. How we can handle this thing? So this, is, I, I mean, this is also another one. The last one I'm, I, I brought here is uh, how we can connect to common sense, symbolic reasoning. I just showed that FERCN and uh, intended to connect to ontology for this purpose. But this is also uh, one of the challenges we need to solve. Here, I propose a new network architecture uh, to solve these challenges. It's not proven yet, but it's going to be very good at solving these challenges. I will show you how. Let's say we have a class. Then class can be represented as a union of clusters. But the clusters can be shaped many ways. So this, this shape, all kinds of shape. Why not representing the shape of clusters with the hyperbox? Hyperbox means uh, it can be rec just uh, rectangle or, but uh, so this is uh, why this is important. You can very, you can use this hyperbox to generalize the space a lot more effectively. So, and then also, you can handle noble samples. So I, I will talk about this one, uh, one by one. Also, it's a lot better for generalization. So how we can go to multi-layer? Uh, here, these uh, 
clusters are generated, I mean, represented by these hyperboxes of a different shape, a different size and uh, shape. Then uh, pro con conditional probability associated with hyperbox, or this cluster is uh, moving up, upward. And then in the new space, it is formed another cluster or another class. This is uh, continuously repeating. Uh, so this is uh, one process. We, we have this distribution. Yeah, this uh, initial representation. Then this is hyperbox representation in, in, in one layer. Here is a, is a well-known example. There, there are so many clustering algorithms. I mean, you have uh, yeah, mean shift, k-means, uh, spectral analysis. Uh, uh, there are many interesting well-known methods, but this hyperbox method you can compare, and then uh, we have uh, definitely advantages. But, so this advantage means we ha have better generalization, precision, and interpretability in deep learning. I will show you. So how? You have hyperbox. This hyperbox can be used as some sort of a Gaussian mixture model. Uh, and then what it means is that you can divide the space by Bayesian posterior probability. So that this segmentation of space turns out to be much more general than uh, maybe sigmoid or the other nonlinear functions. So also mathematically, this is very good because we have now Bayesian posterior probability associated with the network. So that uh, mathematically it can be well defined. So this is uh, uh, that. Uh, so for instance, I mean, the, in this case, uh, if we compare, yeah, this SVM, then uh, this one is uh, how this one segments the space to achieve generality. So the other thing is that, uh, as I said, uh, this can go to the multi-layer here, but it's coming back. Now, this is backward uh, pass can generate the features and the reconstruct features. And then uh, in, in this uh, uh, either backward pass or, uh, I mean, a nearest neighbor reconstruction pass or a K nearest neighbor interpolation reconstruction pass. In, in, in various ways of reconstruction, you can generate uh, different uh, reconstruction shape. Okay, I, I will quickly. So uh, interpretability wise, these colors represent probability associated with one. We tested this MNIST data set. So yeah, so I'm no time. So this is uh, interpretability. So as I said, uh, if we have this, uh, yeah, I mean, uh, this in each layer that uh, what is more, uh, I mean, the, what uh, emphasized in probability, uh, which, which, which uh, part is. So that we can see, uh, this is another example. This is similar to heat map. In, in each layer. Now, one thing interesting, one interesting thing is, uh, yeah, I mean, the, I, I talked about reconstruction, but then uh, it can also work as a general adversarial generative network, GAN. It can generate, because this space is uh, probabilistically de defined, you can choose any point and you can reconstruct, it can be a generator. So uh, it's a different uh, way of uh, generating something like an adversarial uh, yeah, network. Now, 
one example here is uh, this is a cup. I, if we use FPLCNN, cup missed this handle, and then it fails, or it provides low probability. But in the CSNet, it identifies this one because it is able to pick up noble samples based on this uh, hyperbox. So that, uh, so that uh, if we use that one, then uh, this one is also con uh, connected to ontology, and then uh, this uh, F the, 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 the failed recognition by FPICNN can be recovered by CSNet. So I will now I will conclude my talk. As, as, uh, I just presented a deep learning-based approach to overcoming the limitation of conventional vision-based robotic task is presented. Yeah, in particular, construction and reconstruction of D features are em emphasized as a means of hybridizing data-driven and symbolic reasoning. And then uh, my real emphasis is uh, how we can meet the challenges of quantitative learning towards uh, the development of a true cognitive engine. So that is uh, why I presented uh, this new architecture. It is uh, currently ongoing in, in the development. So if uh, it comes uh, uh, more results, then I will happy to report to you again. One last comment. We have open access real 3D object DB in our lab. So if you are interested in, uh, I can share this one with you. So uh, these are my collaborators uh, for this, this work. So this is uh, our database. Uh, here, this is the 3D camera we have developed. So uh, this has uh, 0 0.2 millimeter accuracy. And then we have uh, uh, this turntable, we can build a full model, real 3D model. You know that Berkeley has uh, uh, this 3D data capturing environment. It has very complicated, uh, I mean, it has uh, five or six, uh, uh, this high performance camera plus uh, some, yeah, some other thing. We have only one camera. We can do very accurate data construction. So these are uh, the 3D data we have constructed so far. Uh, you can see, yeah. Uh, so you can, it's not uh, perfect yet, but you can go to this uh, uh, website, you can access this one. But we will continue update our 3D data so that uh, you can use it uh, if you want. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, we, we are now open for f a few questions. We, Olivier Pironneau, down there. Uh, <clears throat> I wonder if uh, your segmented approach, uh, it seems to be favorable to uh, multiprocessing on GPUs or something like that. Do you use this advantage also? Yeah, we are using GPU, uh, uh, NVIDIA Pascal. Uh, we have four GPUs, so yeah. Uh -huh. So we implement all these things uh, using uh, TensorFlow. The students are very good at uh, manipulating all these uh, uh, TensorFlow code to <laughs> make it work. I think this is not easy, but they are very good at it. So I'm, I really appreciate their effort, yeah. Olivier. Yes, my question, uh, my question relates to the notion of proof. Uh, we all know that uh, it's important, uh, especially if you interact with human beings, to prove that your system is capable of uh, doing the right things. We also know that the proof of uh, programs, uh, standard programs, is extremely difficult. So I was wondering whether you've thought about the problem of proving that your system, your architecture, 
is correct in some sense, in the sense that it does the right thing? Uh, this is a very difficult question, but important question, I think, yes. in the end. Uh, um, without proof, we cannot 100% uh, guarantee anything, yeah? So that's important, but at this moment, uh, frankly speaking, I did not have time to, or did not have what uh, some rooms to pay attention to completeness because uh, right now, more time to develop something at this moment. But I agree with you. We have to go to that analysis. Yeah. Sooner or later. Yeah. I, uh, I may have a question. Oh, oh there is a question. Uh, Stefan Mala. So uh, one problem that you mentioned, which is really important in 3D, is are the different representations, whether you use voxels or mesh or point clouds and so on. So in your experience, after doing all these uh, experiments, what is the most appropriate and what have you been doing for the representation at the low level? So actually, in the beginning when we developed conventional vision for robotic task, uh, we used the voxel-based representation. So to continue this line of uh, work, uh, we just uh, adopted uh, voxelization. But I think it's also interesting to see which representation is more important, more efficient. I think there is an oak tree, I mean, uh, this uh, some sort of uh, uh, multi-resolution oak tree kind of thing. That may be as also efficient, I think. So, uh, so I, 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 to answer your question, we just uh, adopted the voxel representation because uh, that's the way we have been doing for many, many years. But I guess uh, this is also something we need to look into, I think, yeah. Could you tell us uh, what, what you mean by ontologies and uh, how they are implemented in your uh, systems? Uh, this ontology is implemented based on uh, United Nations standard format. Uh, so, and then uh, we have this object, then uh, the, how this object is composed of uh, the local features or whatever. Then let's say, if, yeah, we, if we define cup, how we can define cup? Cup can be defined in this way. Cup must have a concave part to hold the liquid. But cup should not be large, so the human cannot grasp that's not cup, right? Maybe that's uh, something else. But if, even though, if it's larger, but then it has a handle, it's okay, because human can grasp the handle. So this is the way we define object and then parts or whatever, yeah. So that uh, if we have these uh, yeah, reconstructed features connected, then we can understand these things through this ontology, yeah. 